Good afternoon. I want to welcome commissioners and members of the public to our September 15th, 2022 Maryland Healthcare Commission meeting. This meeting is a hybrid commission meeting. There are several commissioners in room 100 and the rest of the commissioners are participating by Zoom. Given that it's a hybrid meeting, additional ground rules will continue to apply. I'll begin the meeting with the roll call of commissioners. During the meeting, I'll ask the people who are speaking identify themselves before speaking. That way, commissioners and members of the public will know who is talking and will have the same knowledge as those who in room 100. All commissioners are unmuted and may speak. The public and most staff should self-mute and may not speak unless recognized by the chair. Due to the possibility of background noise, I ask commissioners and presenters to mute their electronic devices when they're not speaking. As previously stated, the MHCC post documents that will be enacted on will be acted on or discussed at least a day in advance so that members of the public will have time to download them before the meeting begins. We will continue to provide advance notice of how to register for and dial into the meeting by posting that information on the homepage of the commission's website and our various social media channels. So I'll call the roll now. Uh, Commissioner Bandari. Here. Welcome, Commissioner Boyer. Here. Commissioner Brumbot. Here. Commissioner Buzinski. Here. Commissioner Dorden. Here. I can see Commissioner Jensen. Commissioner Metz. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Commissioner O'Connor. Here. Commissioner O'Grady. Come back, Commissioner Ojikutu. See Commissioner Wang and Commissioner Wood. Here. Thank you. We'll do one more call from Commissioner O'Connor, just in case. And Commissioner Ochikuchi. Here. here. O'Connor here. Thank you. Wait, I'm sorry, it was O'Grady. Commissioner O'Grady and Commissioner Ochikuchi, I, I have is not with us. We do have a quorum, however, so we can proceed. Moving on to agenda item number one. Approval of minutes included in your packets are copies of the minutes from the July 21, 2022 public meeting of the commission that took place in person and by video conference. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the July 21, 2022 commission meeting. So moved. Okay. A second. O'Connor. Thank you. That was Commissioner Jensen moved. Uh, Commissioner Wang seconded. Is there any discussion? Are there any opposed? Out of objection, approval of the minutes are approved. Then item number two, update of activities. Commissioners have received the written updates from our centers. Commissioners, do you have any questions on the written updates? <clears throat> ben, does the executive director have any updates? Uh, thank, <coughs> thank you, Chairman Sergeant. Uh, first off, a couple statewide um, pieces of information for the uh, total cost of care model. On uh, August 17th, the uh, governor and CMMI uh, signed a, a MOU that, clar that clarified the savings targets that the state was going to meet for the next uh, three years. Oh, no, I'm surprised. Oh, well. We are getting some feedback on the line. Uh, in addition to the savings targets, uh, it outlined the path for moving forward as we move to in, towards the end of this performance period, uh, which ends in 2026. Uh, the state is anxious to move forward uh, on the next phase of the model, and it lays out in the agreement that uh, the steps we would take. Of particular note um, is our, our uh, commitment uh, to begin planning beginning uh, in the late fall of 2022 uh, by convening uh, a number of stakeholder groups focusing on cost containment and financial targets, population health and health equity, uh, post-acute care, uh, post-acute and long-term care expansion of the model, uh, 
improved consumer engagement, uh, multi-payer alignment with uh, both Medicaid and uh, commercial payers, and then physician uh, uh, engagement and alignment under the model. These uh, six subgroups will begin meeting this uh, fall. If commissioners have an interest in participating in any of the groups, uh, please let me know. Uh, after this meeting, I'll provide you with a little bit more detail so you have a better idea of, uh, of what the areas might be uh, in those subgroups. Uh, in addition, the, the, uh, the arrangements under the model really kind of uh, lock us down into trying to get this all done by the by the 2024 election period. I think there's you know, some concern on the state that we try to uh, agree before the next election, given uh, administrations could change and uh, approaches uh, could could uh, therefore uh, also evolve at the national level. Uh, in addition to the uh, agreement that was signed on August 17th, I also just wanted to let everyone know that CMS issued a letter to the state on uh, approximately July 15th, shortly before our July meeting, in which they confirmed that Maryland had met five of the six requirements under the model, the one that the state did not meet, uh, re the readmissions and reductions, uh, the, 30, the Medicare 30-day unadjusted all-cause, all-site hospital readmission rate in Maryland was about 0.23% uh, above the national average. Technically, we are not uh, in compliance and could the federal government could ask us to embark on a corrective action plan. They have not done that, uh, but it does uh, really convey that there are, unlike the old waiver, waiver uh, as part of a model, meeting these six conditions is critical to continuing, uh, continuing of the demonstration. So we're paying very close attention to it. There is you know, some concern uh, for this year, given that the global budget protected hospitals in Maryland from the fluctuations that uh, hospitals across the rest of the country saw in utilization as a result of COVID. That was a good thing, but it also meant that our average cost per case um, uh, is likely to be above the national average for 2022, which could pose uh, an especially uh, significant challenge to the model. So HSCRC uh, is monitoring that closely as we close out the rest of the year in terms of what impact that might have uh, going forward. But that would be a more significant uh, consequence uh, to model performance moving ahead over the next couple of years. Turning to our own activities, I wanted to highlight a few of them. One is that uh, many of you recall that in the 2020 session, uh, Senate Bill uh, 1148, uh, on health, uh, two-sided health insurance, two-sided risk arrangements uh, was a pass and signed, passed by the legislature, signed by Governor Hogan. That's for the first time puts in place uh, in Maryland, the ability of, of commercial insurers to offer two-sided risk arrangements, which is really you know, the direction that, that reimbursement and value-based purchasing, uh, value-based uh, uh, rewards payment systems are moving in. Uh, and under that legislation, the commission was directed to uh, examine the cost effectiveness and quality of these programs. Uh, throughout the summer, we have, uh, first of all, worked with a consultant, Friedman Healthcare, uh, to develop a, a hypothetical template. We uh, met early on with the five major payers that operate the state care first, United Healthcare, Aetna, Aetna. Reporting in progress. Heiser, Heiser uh, to discuss. Uh, to dis I think we're getting a bit of feedback again uh, to discuss uh, their ability to meet some of these uh, requirements. Uh, we now have released uh, to the insurers a draft template that would gather information on non claim based reimbursement consistent with what the law requires the MHCC to do. Uh, and uh, we 
anticipate uh, some feedback from payers. We will also be meeting with the provider community to make them aware of what information we will be collecting, collecting on a non-claim uh, basis. Uh, the, the framework is going to be a, a bit different because the level of reporting will be at a practice level rather than the detailed uh, claim level information. These, these uh, payment arrangements are typically uh, constructed so that rewards uh, or penalties are distributed at the uh, provider in the, uh, the practice level as opposed to individual physician or much less a patient level. More to come on that. This will be brought before the commission. Uh, when we talk about release of the, uh, the data reporting submission forms for claims uh, in, uh, in November, uh, this form will be uh, added to that uh, if we can generally reach consensus. Uh, and payers then would report on this document, not on a quarterly basis as they do with claims, but at the end of the year as a, an, an annual uh, reconciliation process uh, that they would submit after that had been with practices. Um, this, this same arrangement is, uh, is being completed in a number of states, not for the purpose of a two-sided risk arrangement, but because they believe it's important to fully capture uh, the healthcare reimbursements that are going to uh, provider organizations. Uh, and those states include uh, Colorado, uh, Massachusetts, and about a half a dozen others, but those are two states that we kind of looked at for models for moving, moving forward. In general, I would say the national payers uh, have been uh, willing to talk to us about this and Care Fact First uh, staff have given us some suggestions that they thought would be helpful as well. So uh, it's generally a positive, uh, positive uh, endeavor, more, more so than we thought. A couple other things that I haven't brought your attention to. Uh, we mentioned our behavioral health risk assessment study. Uh, what we are learning uh, about that is that really the Behavioral Health Administration is already underway uh, with many of the directives we are uh, we were charged with by the legis by the legislation. Uh, and so we're kind of looking at how we might, uh, make what we are charged with doing useful and not redundant or in any in a way um, uh, cumbersome for uh, BHA to, to uh, assist us in developing uh, this response. Um, the, the sponsor or the uh, senator who placed us in the uh, in what we call the uh, uh, the budget documents. Uh, the budget reconciliation uh, documents uh, is Senator Addie Eckert, who actually lost her um, her election, her primary bid. So she won't be returning to the legislature and we'll want to try to gauge if there are other senators who take up this interest. A second area that was uh, that um, is included in the budget documents uh, include a, a requirement that MHCC conduct a study of financial restrictions on organ transplants. Uh, we had missed that uh, earlier in the summer, uh, and it requires us to look at the policy, the financial policies that uh, health systems that have, offer organ transplant services uh, provide. Uh, uh, communications have gone out to uh, Hopkins University uh, and MedStar, and we are getting uh, some information back on these policies. Uh, these are these are corporate sensitive documents, and uh, we've assured the health systems that uh, while we need to review those, uh, they would be subject to uh, Public Information Act restrictions. We would consult them before that information would would be uh, re-released by the commission. That seems to have uh, reassured them. Uh, about sharing this information with commission staff. We also have worked on the major uh, work groups that were assigned to us. Uh, we're about ready to start uh, one of those as the palliative care group. Uh, we also have uh, agreed to uh, assist the secretary in a, in a work group which focuses 
on workplace violence in healthcare settings. Uh, that's actually what was assigned to the department. The secretary asked that the commission if we would take it on. And uh, Teresa Lee and I have worked uh, to, to put a, put a uh, work group together. The secretary is uh, going to send out confirmations of, of the membership and we look forward to starting that uh, group uh, shortly. Uh, Dr. Blair Ike, head of the Maryland Patient Safety Center has agreed to uh, chair that uh, group and I have asked Scott Trust Lee to be uh, vice chair. Uh, we expect that, that that group would meet three to four times between now and the end of the year. The goal is to develop a plan, not to necessarily implement that plan and clearly uh, a public engagement campaign to raise awareness on workplace violence is something that we wouldn't have the budget to carry out ourselves. Um, this has been uh, a particularly uh, important issue to you know, a colleague uh, that we've worked with in a number of settings. Uh, Peggy Townsend pushed this through uh, initiative uh, for a couple of years and uh, the legislature opted to take that up, uh, take that up just this year. Uh, and lastly, uh, we are still configuring our, our work group to study uh, addition, additional oversight of, of small assisted living uh, facilities. If commissioners are interested in serving on that, please get in touch with me. Uh, I think it'll, it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting work group. Uh, small assisted living uh, facilities uh, are not subject uh, to quite as much uh, scrutiny because they are small. Uh, there are approximately 1,300 assisted living um, entities uh, licensed in the state. We report information on about 300 of them through our public reporting portal. The smaller ones we do not. Uh, and there are, quite, there are obviously some questions about what else, what the other state agencies are doing that have direct authority. Uh, over performance at those facilities. Uh, Senator Vidal um, from, from Anne Arundel County is particularly interested in that. And if you're interested, you can help us uh, by participating. By all means, let us know. Uh, I'll stop here. If there are questions, happy to answer them. Is there any questions? Uh, and uh, Teresa has one announcement. Uh, oh, OK. Um, I'd like to um, introduce Stacy Howes, not introduce her, she's an employee here, but she wanted to give an update on some work she's done on nursing home acquisitions. I think she started some work for you and we just wanted to give a, a summary of that. So Stacy, could you, um, I guess, unmute yourself and give us your update? Can you hear me okay? 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 Stacy, you might be on to uh, yes. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm I'm having some connection issues. I apologize. Actually, you're fine now. Um, okay. <laughs> At the May 2022 commission meeting, I presented a table that showed that overall satisfaction with the nursing homes has declined fairly significantly over the past several years. And MHCC and other stakeholders are concerned that nursing home acquisitions might be associated with poorer quality and lower satisfaction. So staff categorized nursing homes into three categories during the years 2015 to 2017. The three categories were no acquisitions, operator acquisitions and or property acquisitions. And the final category was property only acquisitions. And we plotted the average overall satisfaction score from the Nursing Home Family Experience of Care Survey, survey from 2013 to 2021. And even though all nursing homes in all three of those acquisition categories decreased in satisfaction over time, the two categories of acquisitions have a much lower average score in 2013 compared to nursing homes with no acquisitions and continue to have the lowest score every single year through 2021. So that's what I presented in 2022, I'm sorry, in May of 2022. 
And at the request of Chairman Sargent, the data were divided into profit for profit nursing homes and not for profit nursing homes. There were 54 not for profit nursing homes, and none of them underwent a property only acquisition between 2015 and 2017, and only two of them experienced an acquisition in that time period. So the overall satisfaction rates were essentially the same for nursing homes with and without an acquisition every single year from 2013 to 2021. But of course, this should be interpreted cautiously because again, there was only two nursing homes that experienced an acquisition. And then there were um, 162 for-profit nursing homes. And the pattern was very similar to the findings when all nursing homes were grouped together. So for-profit nursing homes that experience no acquisitions almost always have a higher overall satisfaction score than the other two acquisition categories. And regardless of whether there were acquisitions, the overall satisfaction score decreased over time from 2013 to 2021. And that concludes my update. Thank you. Commissioner Jensen. Yeah, I, I have a, a question. Um, did your study um, look at the time frame after the acquisition? So, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm just guessing, but I would assume immediately after the acquisition there was a dip, and did it did it stay there? Did it get worse or did it get better as time passed? Or, or did um, you yes, not? Were we, you not able to look at that? Uh, no, we looked at so the acquisitions all happened between 2015 and 2017. And we were looking at before, during, and after. And they do decrease after an acquisition, but they also, the scores also decreased um, when there wasn't an acquisition. So everyone went down over time, all nursing I, homes across. I guess the I'm asking a slightly more nuanced question, which is okay. as, as they're, as you get further and further away from the acquisition, do the satisfaction scores stay low, get lower, or get higher? If there's an acquisition in 17 and the score goes down five points, you go back mm -hmm. to the same place uh, in, in 19, is the score the same place? Need more years. No, it does not. So you're asking yeah. that's a good question. It might be, need more years in the study yeah. to see that. I can look at it even more, but from what we've seen so far, no, the scores do not go back up to original scores. Out up to 2021 anyway. The reason I ask is that in, in, in mergers and acquisitions work, if you look at employee satisfaction, it almost always goes down immediately after a transaction. And then if the transaction is managed well, it starts to tick back up. Right? If it's not managed well, they quit or it stays down. <laughs> But then, you know, and it makes sense because people are uncertain about yeah. change. And... Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. I think Josh Commissioner Metz is that. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, uh, not really surprised at, at these findings. Um, uh, from a personal point of view, I mean, my facilities rankings stay pretty consistent they're either up a little bit or down a little bit, but they're, they're very good. Uh, it will be interesting to see though, because we've had a number of acquisitions across the state since the study was performed um, at very, very high dollar uh, transactions uh, to see how much more that would impact this, this type of study. I mean, the commission's aware. I mean, we've seen, bed prices anywhere from the low side of, you know, 70,000 all the way up through the high side of over 200,000 a bed, um, which can then subsequently uh, impact perhaps uh, the quality of care at a facility when you have to service a, a much higher mortgage. Um, I mean, I know the commission uh, has been asked uh, and of course the industry in general is trying to finagle or figure out a way to um, monitor these transactions for such prices uh, as it relates to care. Uh, but 
uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yep. With that, I think we'll move on to action items. Before we consider action items today, I want to remind commissioners if they wish to recuse themselves on any action item, they should inform the chair. For commissioners who are participating remotely, who desire to recuse, you should remain silent and turn off your camera and mute your phone during the discussion. Commissioners in room 100 who are recused should move to the small conference room. Chairman, yes, sir. Um, we're going to talk about the Franklin Square uh, CON application. I would recuse myself. Uh, normally, my, since it's been withdrawn, I'm not sure there's a need for me to do that. That's agenda item number four. We're, we're not going to do agenda item number four at this time. So. Perfect. Make it maybe back, maybe back in October. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, turning. Right. So, the, go ahead. Just if, on the, the Franklin Square uh, application was withdrawn. Uh, and then uh, last, yesterday afternoon, we were informed that uh, Communicare's application to um, seek an exemption from CON for the conversion of several of its. Uh, nursing homes in Prince George's County had been withdrawn uh, for, for, uh, for for reasons that the council needs to uh, council for community care needs to talk with uh, internally, and we expect that one to come back in in October. I do not expect Franklin Square's uh, kidney application to come forward. They still have an app. A outstanding liver application that we are just beginning to take under study. Thank you, Ben. With that turning to agenda item number three certificate of need for Carroll County Home Health Agency. Oh, I'm sorry, Carroll County Health Home Health Agency review. 3A is the review of certificate of need for Adventist Home Health Services, Inc. So, agenda items 3A and 3B are review of Home Health Agency services applications for a certificate of need in Carroll County filed by two applicants, Adventist Home Health Services, Inc. and CareNet Health Systems and Services, Inc. DBA Lorraine. The commission will consider each application separately. Eric Baker, CON analyst, will present the, present the staff recommendation for Adventist Home Health Services. Eric, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chairman, Sergeant, and Commissioners. These two CON requests are for the expansion of Home Health Agency Services in Carroll County. Before providing information about the project, some background on the home health chapter of the state health plan is useful to understand. <clears throat> the home health chapter regulates the development and expansion of home health agency services in Maryland based on policy decision by this commission <clears throat> that consumers need choice of high quality home health agency providers. Based on provision, provisions in Comar, <clears throat> excuse me, 1026, 1604, the commission established two review cycles for 2022. <clears throat> Home health projects in five jurisdictions where need for additional agencies was determined. One for Carroll County and the second for four counties configured and defined as the lower Eastern shore region. Pursuant to COMAR 1024-1606B, an applicant shall apply as one of three types of applicants. It can be an existing Medicare certified home health agency licensed in Maryland, proposing to add one or more jurisdictions to its service area, or an agency licensed in another state, proposing to establish a new home health agency, or it may be a non-home health service provider currently licensed and accredited in good standing as either a hospital, a nursing home, or a Maryland residential service agency. It's important to note that the commission only accepts CON applications from applicants providing this required documentation to demonstrate meeting general qualifications for all applicants. Adventist Home Health Services Incorporated, or Adventist, is one of only 18 Maryland Medicare certified home health agencies that met the required performance level in the current CMS home health compared data set, and thus qualified to apply for a CON to expand the agency's current authorization in this 2022 CON review cycle. Adventist proposes to expand its current service area to Carroll County. 
It currently serves eight counties, including the surrounding areas of Montgomery, Frederick, and Howard counties. The startup cost of this project, inclusive of legal fees and contingencies, is estimated to be $94,345. The applicant plans to fund the cost of this project with cash. A CON can be issued if the commission finds that the proposed action is consistent with the following four requirements. It is consistent with the state health plan. It will meet a need that exists in the healthcare system. It will result in a more efficient and effective delivery of healthcare services, and it is in the public interest. Staff reviewed the consistency of the proposal with the 11 elements of the state health plan standards in the home health chapter. Adventists met all standards within the home health chapter of the state health plan, including the charity care standard. Staff reviewed the proposal in meeting the criteria within the state health plan as well. Regarding need, in addition to the de facto need identified through Comar 1026-1604 in the home health chapter, <clears throat> Adventists used Maryland state planning data and identified need in the 65 and above age cohort. <clears throat> That population is expected to increase with a 52.7% change between 2020 and 2030, which will create much greater need for home health services in Carroll County. As to cost effectiveness, as an existing provider of healthcare services, Adventist referenced their ability to tap into existing overhead functions when they develop home health services in Carroll County. Adventist has existing offices and shared administrative and supervisory services with the parent organization, which can help it effectively provide more choice and competition in Carroll County. The alternative to not implementing the project would be to leave Carroll County in need of additional providers. Concerning viability and financial feasibility, the project will be financed with cash and Adventist has demonstrated that they have the resources necessary to implement and sustain the proposed venture. Compliance with previous CONs, and Venice has a long history with this commission, having complied with 14 prior CONs. Given the population projections for the 65 and older cohort, impact on other providers is likely to be minimal, only impeding those providers' potential to attract a larger percentage of clients in the future. In summary, staff concludes that the proposed project complies with the applicable standards in Comar 1024-16 the Home Health Agency Services Chapter, the State Health Plan. The need for additional home health agency services has been identified, and Adventist expansion of home health services in Carroll County provides a viable, cost-effective approach to meeting that need. Based on all of the factors discussed, staff recommends that the Commission find this CO and application to be in the public interest. Staff recommends approval of this project with the following standards that apply to most home health applications. The Adventist maintain compliance with the provisions of Comar 1024-1608E sections one through four regarding charity care, the siting fee scale, and reduced fee services. Number two, that provide a level of charity care equivalent to or greater than the average level of charity care provided by home health agencies in Carroll County. And number three, prior to its request for first use approval, provide documentation of its links with other healthcare service providers in the Carroll County service area. Before I conclude, I'd like to introduce part of the management team attending online from Adventist. <clears throat> I believe online from Adventist is Andrew Nicholas, Deputy General Counsel, Howard Solons, Outside Counsel, Myra De La Cruz Salvataro, Administrator of Adventist Home Care Services, and Susan Severi, Associate Vice President of Finance. We can answer any questions at this time. Thank you. We, um, and, and welcome. So uh, I just want to note, Commissioner O'Grady, welcome. Just to get on the record that you join us. And um, can I get, before we have discussion, can I get a motion to approve the certificate of need for Adventist Home Health Service? So I, Commissioner Wang. Wang. Uh, Commissioner Bandari, we'll, we'll have you be the second. How's that? And with that, are there any commissioners who have questions? Hearing no questions, 
I think I, this is Commissioner Mandar. I have a question. I know it, it says in that how much charity they are going to do. It says uh, equivalent or greater than the average level of charity. What is that level is? The, the level of charity care is actually it's pretty low um, across home health care agency services. Um, it's I think less than one percent. I guess we could ask Adventists what what level of charity care they they anticipate providing. Folks up from Adventist are on the phone. Sure. Yeah, this is Andrew Nicholas. Thank you uh, for the question. Um, I'm pulling up the, the application. I'm looking at the application now. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, either um, my colleague, uh, Mario Dela Cruz, or Susan Savory um, to see if they have that answer at, at their fingertips. Hello. Um, name's Mario. Um, currently, right now, um, percent of patients receiving charity care in Carroll County, it's 0.005%. That's pretty low. So that is, uh, we, our goal is to achieve more than that. That's a very low number. Okay. Yeah, I think hope you will do a better job, at least maybe 5%. That will, I will request. I think the exceeding the average is written into our regulation. Am I right about that? That's correct. Are there, are there any other questions? That I will uh, call the motion. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any, thank you. Are there any opposed? Motion passes. With that one, we can turn on to action item 3B, Internet Health Systems and Services, Inc. Eric, please proceed with the CareNet Health Systems and Services staff recommendation. Thank you, Chairman Fowler. Sorry. As mentioned, there were two CO1 requests for the expansion of home health agency services in Carroll County. The same background in the home health chapter of the state health plan applies as described in the Adventist application. CareNet Health Systems and Services Incorporated, doing business as Lorian Health Systems Mount Airy, or Loran, is a Maryland Medicare certified nursing home that met the required performance levels in the current CMS nursing home compare data set, and that's qualified to apply for a COF to establish a new home health agency in this 2022 CON review cycle. Loran proposes to establish a new home health agency and use the existing Mount Airy office as a base of operations to serve Carroll County. The apl applicant projects spending $230,000 and to fund the project with cash. Lorian will, upon CON approval, take the steps necessary to obtain home health licensure and Medicare certification, which is estimated to take approximately 12 months to complete. Again, a CON can be issued if the commission finds that the proposed action is consistent with the state health plan, will meet a need that exists in the healthcare system, will result in more efficient and effective delivery of healthcare services, and it's in the public interest. Staff reviewed the consistency of the proposal with the 11 elements of the state health plan standard at the home health chapter. Lorraine also met all standards within the home health chapter of the state health plan, including the charity care standard. Staff again reviewed the proposal and meeting the criteria within the state health plan. Regarding need, and again, in addition to the de facto need identified through Comar 1026 1604 in the home health chapter, Lorraine used Maryland state planning data and identified a clear need in the 65 and above age cohort. As to cost effectiveness, as, again, as an existing provider of healthcare services, Lorian referenced their ability to utilize existing overhead functions in Mount Airy when they develop home health agency services in Carroll County. Lorian's existing offices and shared administrative and supervisory services can assist it in providing more choice, competition in Carroll County in a cost-effective manner. Again, the alternative to not implementing the project would be to leave Carroll County in need of additional providers. Concerning viability and financial feasibility, the project will be financed with cash by Lorian, and they have demonstrated they have resources necessary to implement and sustain their proposed venture. 
And again, Lauren also has a long history with this commission, having complied with 13 prior COS. Again, the impact on other providers is likely to be minimal given the population projections for the 65 and older car holder is so great. So in summary, staff concludes that the proposed project complies with the applicable standards in Comar 1024-16, the Home Health Agency Services Chapter of the State Health Plan. The need for additional home health agency services has been identified and Lauren's establishment of new home health agency services in Carroll County will provide a viable cost-effective approach to meeting that need. Based on the factors mentioned, staff recommends the commission find this CO1 application to be in the public interest. Staff recommends approval of this project with the same three conditions as applied to Adventist. And for Lorian, there's an additional condition that is a new home health agency applicant that prior to the request for first use approval, they provide documentation of their final version of the proposed charity care policy that was outlined in their application. Before I conclude, I would like to introduce part of the management team attending from Lorian. Um, James Forsyth is counsel. Christy Luquette is director of operations for Lorian at home. Michael Snarski is accountant for Lorian, and Andy Solberg is a planning consultant. We can answer any questions at this time. Thank you. So before we have discussion, and, and welcome. Before we have discussion, can I get a mission to a motion to approve the certificate of need for CareNet Health Systems and Services Inc.? So moved. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jensen. Great tag team right here. Commissioner Wang has seconded. So I need at least two people to attend, although I welcome the rest, <laughs> welcome the rest of the commissioners to come attend too. <laughs> Give yourselves a shot at getting the motions in the second. They're just too quick. <laughs> and the uh, with that, is there a uh, are there any questions? Good discussion. Chairman, I just have a quick question. It's a great report, and I'm glad we have more people come in to provide services for Carroll County. Should we be concerned that, according to the report, nearly 70% of all the folks being served by HHAs in Carroll County are being served by HHAs that are below the commission-approved quality performance requirements? I think that's one of the factors that goes into the decision to open up Carroll County to additional, you know, competitors. Why, oh, sure. Why are, why are these agencies dipping? I assume they met our requirements at one point and they're dipping below them now. Do we have any? Or was, are the requirements so, changed? So left these, behind? these requirements when we updated the state health plan chapter for home health agencies uh, were new uh, in 20, 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. So most of those were already were operating in the state uh, and therefore we're not subject to the requirements that we've established today. Um, you know, that's the dilemma with use tying some quality performance standards uh, that if you don't come before us with an application, you're not necessarily subject to that. You know, that being said, we do uh, through our quality reporting website, uh, highlight the performance of all um, home health agencies. Um, and we continue to, to look for tactics that would you know, more fully engage consumers, but in terms of our ability to call, cause them to cease operations, we have no, no ability to do that. Uh, we can certainly continue to shine the light on performance in the industry, but uh, the CON process, uh, quality requirements are effective only if you come before us to get a CON. Is anybody going to these folks? We don't want to put them out of business. Or is anyone going to them and engaging them and getting them, you know, trying to help them to up their game to meet these requirements? They're communicated with in terms of uh, being aware of what we publish. Uh, I don't think we reach out directly to any low performers, but uh, Teresa Lee is here. I have some of the not at, this, that. not at this time. We don't do that. Certainly, certainly we can do that. Um, and try to think of ways in which we can engage them a bit more. But now, at this point, we really don't. The statistics, yeah. the, the statistics we're relying on to say that low performers, that's not us that's making that assessment, right? Those are federal measures. Those are federal measures. And they know that they're what they're doing under the federal measures, right? They don't yes. need us to tell them that. Right. They are aware. Of that. They're, they're aware they should be. And we publicly report on that. So 
pay consumers aware that it's not built into this process because this is fairly new to the EON process to add to quality. There's seventy percent of providers, that even if consumers know, they're a little harder for choice. So could we have? So could we have two more applicants today? Thank you. Are there any other questions or, or comments? With that, uh, I'll take all in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Great. Motion passed. Thank you. Thanks to the folks from Eventist and Laureate. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is Howard Sollins. I was asked to convey my thanks to uh, Mr. Baker and the rest of the CON staff and to the commission for the approval and for the uh, deep look and, uh, and uh, consideration of this expansion project. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you as well, Mr. Baker, for your presentation. With that, we can turn to agenda item number five. We're gonna skip over agenda item number four. I'm going to go to agenda item number five, the City of Baltimore Monument Analytics MCDB data request application. Under current statutes and regulations governing access to MCDB data for research use, the commission must approve an application for MCDB data before the release of MCDB data to an applicant. The City of Baltimore Law Department applied for the MCDB data. Mahi Nagatu will present the staff review and recommendation for the application. Thank you, Chairman Sergeant. Good afternoon, commissioners. As the chairman mentioned, I'll be presenting the internal data release advisory committee report and recommendation pertaining to the Baltimore City Law Department application, prepared with assistance from staff. Next slide, please. The, the MCDB uh, data release is governed under Comar 102505. The core components of the data release process consists of an application. After the application is deemed complete, the redacted version of the application will be post posted for uh, public comment. And also if the applicant requests uh, Medicaid data, such as the one that we're looking at today, the application will be sent to Medicaid uh, for a decision. Um, this includes either the continuing with an independent review, disapproval, or to defer to the MACC review process. Once the public comment is complete, uh, the uh, application along with the public comment, if any, and any correspondence with the applicant will, will be presented to the RAC. If approved, the applicant will enter into a data use agreement with the commission. Next slide. The applicant in this case is Baltimore City Law Department and currently they uh, are requesting the MCDB data to assess the extent of the opioid epidemic in the city of Baltimore. Uh, the objective is to estimate the number of individuals affected by the epidemic, as well as looking at the healthcare utilization and prescription related to opioid uh, within the city from the year 2010 to 2020. Slide, please. The purpose of the project, as indicated earlier, is to use the uh, MCDB data to look at the epidemiological impact of the epidemic in the city of Baltimore and use it for litigation purposes. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, for litigation purposes, and it's, uh, it will be done by looking at uh, the population in the MCDB data that had uh, opio opioid use disorder or OUD over time and evaluating uh, the healthcare utilization and prescription as captured in the MCDB. The source, uh, the data source for the project will be solely the MCDB data uh, and will be, the project will be funded internally. Um, in terms of the methodology, uh, the applicant have identified that they'll be looking at descriptive retrospective court analysis uh, by and uh, to see the individuals that were impacted by the epidemic in the city from the years 2010 to 2020. And the study will include individuals from the age 18 and above and exclude individuals uh, in hospice care. The measures um, that will be generated from the study include looking at the number of individuals impacted by OUD, 
uh, and any opioid related uh, complications. The study will also look at cost and utilization annually and over time, and also look at the trend of uh, opioid prescription over time and comparing that with uh, uh, external benchmark. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, the data requested will be the MCDB, um, and this is for the commercial and Medicaid uh, for the years 2010 to 2020 for the commercial component and from 2011 to 2020 for the Medicaid component. Uh, the project will run for a little above a year from October 2022 to December 2023. The project outcome, uh, as mentioned earlier, would be looking at the measures and generating a report, and the um, city might share the report uh, with the Baltimore City Circuit Court, and the report may be publicly filed. Um, let's note that the, um, the report will be aggregated and uh, include non-identifiable data, and also uh, want to stress that um, the MCPV data that extract that the city will receive is already uh, de-identified data, uh, fully de-identified and decrypted data. Uh, the, in terms of the data fee, uh, the data recipient will be charged uh, for, for an amount of uh, 162,000 for the covered data. This is for 11 years of commercial data and 10 years of Medicaid data. Next slide, please. The uh, study uh, team members include uh, Sarah Gross, uh, Chief Solicitor from the City of Baltimore Law Department, Elena Fernandez um, from Monument Analytics. This is the uh, vendor that's tasked with this study. Uh, G. Caleb Alexander, who is going to be the principal investigator, uh, along with David Dowdy and uh, Michael Lawrence, who, will be, who both will be a co-principal investigators in the study. Uh, Bennett Hayes Erickson will uh, be involved in a consultant capacity of the task with analysis and uh, uh, other related um, tasks in the study. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to review and recommendation, the DRAC have found, and this is uh, using Comar 1025 uh, where we have, where it lists out the uh, approval and disapproval criteria, have found that the application have met uh, the requirement for research use as it would look at the estimate um, of number of individuals that are affected by the opioid epidemic, as well as healthcare utilization and prescription in the city of Baltimore from 2010 to 2020. The application is also found to have met uh, the requirement of public interest as the city, as the data and the outcome from this is going to be used for opioid litigation purposes. And the finding from uh, this analysis will provide information to stakeholders and the litigation might result in uh, an award for uh, abatement or and or damage uh, funds that the city could data used to fund programs to address the uh, impact uh, of opioid epidemic in the city. And uh, staff recommends that the commission vote to approve the MCDB data request submitted by Baltimore City Law Department and provide access to the requested data. Uh, in addition, staff also recommends that the commission approve the applicant's request for the use of data uh, until uh, December 31st, 2023, and that's after the execution of the data use agreement. Uh, that concludes my presentation. With us, we have Sarah Gross and Elena Fernandez on online, uh, and I welcome any questions for staff or the project team. Thank you. Why don't we start with the motion? So I have a motion to approve the City of Baltimore Monument Analytics MCDB data request application. Commissioner Wang. Second. And Commissioner uh, Jensen has second. Are there any questions for the Commissioner's house? Um, this is Chair Brady. Uh, can, can I just ask, I, I mean, the merits of this seem quite straightforward. Uh, I'm just a little on the side because I just don't 
think of this sort of, of user as having these sort of resources readily available. Are you quite comfortable with kind of data protection, privacy, uh, kind of protection of this data? Yes. So, okay. so um, we have in the, the draft, the data release review committee looks at this, uh, the security of the data very uh, closely. And we have um, requested follow-up questions of how they would maintain the um, safeguard the data overall. So we we have in the application that is attached in the package, we have the IT policies and then um, other associated uh, documentation such as the SOC 2 and high trust uh, certification that was provided by the applicant. And this is um, specifically for the custodian, which is Monument Analytics. So th those information has already provided and have gone through the due diligence to make sure that they have uh, uh, okay. right uh, security in place. Um, and Good. also require them to update us as uh, when, if, if there's any kind of changes, that's actually in the DOA that would require them to inform the commission if there are any changes in their uh, infrastructure. So are they keeping the data or is it being returned when they're done with their study? So once the data, the study is complete, the applicant is required to destroy the data within 30 days. And um, uh, they have also, the, applic the applicant also have indicated that in their application package and also in their data management plan. But in addition to that, it's also laid out in the data use agreement that they will have to destroy the data and follow specific protocol uh, as provided in the data destruction template. Okay. Um, well, having been the recipient of such, you know, this kind of data in the past, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all that they get into this, they do this study, and then they see, you know, the three other questions that this data would be very helpful in answering for them. Is there a, a procedure here where they can ask for sort of an addendum amendment to do additional analysis, or do they have to start over again? Oh, so, um, that's a good question. So in the past, yes, we haven't had a request um, uh, for technically 21 years of data, 11 years for commercial and 10 years for Medicare. But we have had even uh, Johns Hopkins, that's an application we presented back in May, requested for 10 years of data. This is for both Medicaid and Medicare uh, commercial. Um, so in this case, we um, have the, the requirement is for the applicant to submit a scope of change request if they are planning to kind of expand what they're looking at. Uh, and also the other option is like, let's say they're looking at 2020, the request is for 2010 to 2020. And if they are requesting, if they wanna kind of look at what's, what changed in 2021, that will be uh, a scope of a, a data request, an additional data request. Uh, not that they have to go back through the whole process, but kind of uh, additional data requests. Good. I just think this one may be a little different. I mean, when we get it from an academic, you know, they have a grant, they have a particular kind of paper in mind at the end. This one is more, you know, applied policy. And I can, I, I, as long as kind of the privacy and other things are protected, I wouldn't want to put any roadblocks. The city of Baltimore really wants to dig into this. That seems like a very good movement forward as far as I'm concerned. So I'm not, I'm not trying to indicate some sort of being overly, it's our data, don't touch it. Just, I want to, you know, as long as the protections are in place, I think we should let them run with it, you know, as far and as fast as they'd like. I had a question for um, Chief Solicitor Gross that might help clarify a little bit. This is in support of the city's litigation against uh, opioid manufacturers, isn't it? Is it? Yes, that's correct. So we plan on using the data to not only calculate the prior costs of the city of the opioid crisis that were created by the defendants in this case, but we're also using it to um, create an abatement model to figure out how much, you know, by looking at the past and how much it has cost us uh, to look at the future and how much it continues to cost us, um, you know, not just through fire and police, obviously, but through the, the costs, the medical costs and the human costs. Um, so we can use the data to kind of build a model and show to the court um, 
what our future costs are going to be. Um, because, you know, as we discussed in the application, you know, one of the main goals of this litigation is to recover funds so that we can, um, you know, address the crisis, which, as you're probably aware, has hit Baltimore um, harder than pretty much any other jurisdiction in the entire country. Um, so we're going to use the data to, you know, show the cost to the court um, on an abatement model so that we can then use the funding going forward to create programs and whatnot, further programs than what we already have to, um, you know, address the, the enormous cost that this this crisis is, has taken on Baltimore. Just, just to follow up on that, thank you for, for that uh, information. Would the uh, uh, defendants experts want to get access to this data? I, I'm not sure if they'd be happy with the aggregate or not. Um, so I, I assume they would have to basically move to the court to get access. Um, does, I'm sorry. I was just wondering, does, does this agreement before us uh, give them, give you the right to let them have access to the data if the court orders it? If the court orders it, then yes, we would have to produce the data. But if that were to happen, if a motion like that would be filed, we would loop in the commission to make sure that if it's something that we had to turn over, that there would be parameters in place to ensure the privacy um, of the individuals, you know, whose data it is. Um, we plan on initially restricting it to the aggregate data. Um, if they make a motion before the court, then obviously the commission would be an interested party in that. So um, we would loop you all in so your attorney could make the arguments that it shouldn't be disclosed if the court ultimately orders it. Um, we have a protective order with the other side um, that we signed at the beginning of the litigation to ensure that no data that's exchanged um, between the parties goes outside of that um, and that it's it's confined within the parties. So if a motion came up, we would certainly loop you all in so your attorney could argue to one, argue against disclosure and two, that if somehow the, the information is ordered to be disclosed, that it be protected, that it be included within the scope of the protective order, and so that they could not use it beyond just their own kind of analysis internally. But, but theoretically, we could end up, unless I missed something in this room, theoretically, we could end up in a situation where the court orders the disclosure, but uh, we say that this agreement does not allow it. Yes. Yes, you would. You would. I mean, uh, yes. Obviously, and, we would and then you it. have to make a decision. You, well, well, the court. The court. We all have to work. It wouldn't be much of a decision. Yeah. So the court would have ordered it. The court. Uh, yeah, yeah. The court. If the court orders it, but we would, you know, fight obviously, and I'm sure the attorney general will also fight on your behalf to keep it um, as as limited a disclosure as possible. And like I said, we do have a protective order already in place so that the information we exchange doesn't go outside of the attorneys and their experts. So if it ends up being a disclosure, it would be a limited disclosure to a select few people. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of this agreement and I'm in favor of the disclosure and the use of it for the benefit of Baltimore City. I just uh, am a little concerned about it getting into the hands of the defendants who would then we don't we have sort of lim we here at the commission have limited authority at that point to impose any conditions on uh their data security procedures or anything else we, we have the right to argue at the court but if the court says you know what i think this is the identified data so the, the important the probably the most important protection is that this data itself so. does not does not identify it Yeah, I, I, I uh, thank you. I, I wanted to make sure the commissioners understood that the environment that where this data is going to be stored is in a Microsoft uh, Azure uh, cloud. Um, they, uh, Baltimore City has provided the uh, 
uh, high trust documentation and uh, some sections, some segments of their of Azure's uh, SOC 2 audit. So um, Commissioner O'Grady's op, you know, observation uh, monument is, 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 as he noted, you know, a, a bit smaller, but it's important to emphasize that they are not going to be manipulating this data. It would be quite voluminous, 10 years of, of Medicaid data and 11 years of uh, privately insured. Um, so they need a, need a basically a cloud-based environment. And they've selected one of you know, a handful that we are very confident uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, kind of the most commonly used uh, cloud-based environments that um, organizations are using today. So I think we're, the work that uh, my and her team did to you know, get that information to be very helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions, commissioners who have questions or comments? That, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. Good luck to the city of Baltimore. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I, I am told that the staff is more efficient than I am. So when I skipped over agenda item four, they had adjusted the agenda items so that what was previously number four is now gone. So I actually skipped over a live item and we need to go back. But currently agenda item four is actually now the designation agreement for the Maryland Patient Safety Center. So for those following along at home, your agenda numbers are a little different and I've chosen an order that is not linear. So <clears throat> the commission designates the Maryland Patient Safety Center and monitors their performance. Commissioner Boyle serves on the Patient Safety Center board and keeps abreast of their ongoing programs and, initi and initiatives. In 2022, the General Assembly approved and Governor Hogan signed legislation that appropriated $1 million in general funds to the state designated patient safety center, the Maryland Patient Safety Center, Inc. Under the new law, MHCC was charged with administering the transfer of the general funds. MHCC has modified the designation agreement with the Maryland Patient Safety Center, Inc. to reflect the new funding and MHCC's responsibilities. Teresa Lee, Director for the, of the Center for Quality Measurement and Reporting, will give us a brief background on this project. Dr. Blair Eig, President and CEO of the Maryland Patient, Maryland Patient Safety Center, Inc., will provide an update on the center's activities, accomplishments, and strategic plan. Teresa and Dr. Eig, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Sargent, and good afternoon, Commissioners. In addition to the copy of uh, Dr. Eig's presentation, your packet includes a copy of a new designation agreement between MACC and MPSC, Inc. This agreement replaces the MOU approach we've used in the past and includes very specific requirements associated with $1 million funding allocation, as you mentioned in your summary. Um, this $1 million funding allocation was approved during the 2022 legislative session. I will not review the agreement in detail, but I would like to highlight a few points. This commission is authorized under the state under state law to designate an entity to serve as a Maryland Patient Safety Center for the state of Maryland. The designation is for a five year period. Our first designation was in 2004. At that time, it was for the Maryland Hospital Association and the QIO Delmarva a collaboration that they uh, started in 2004. In 2007, they modified the name of that collaboration and incorporated as Maryland Patient Safety Center, Inc. That was done in 2007, but they serve as the Patient Safety Center for the state of Maryland because of their designation by MHCC. So um, in other words, every five years when it is time for redesignation, it's still uh, a process that is open to other entities possibly. They just happen to have the same name. In January of 2020, we issued a request for expressions of interest or an RFI to determine if there were other entities interested and willing to serve in this role, which is primarily to coordinate patient safety initiatives among hospitals and other healthcare providers across the state. The RFI provided guidance on our priorities, which include aligning with the total cost of care model, 
um, going beyond hospitals to other entities, nursing homes, home health, um, uh, focusing on health equity, looking at the science measures and other um, uh, MDH uh, priorities. There were no other interests from, there were no submissions of applications from other entities. We also asked during that process if there were any comments on the performance of the Maryland Patient Safety Center at that time, and there were no comments other than uh, letters of, of support, primarily from ho other hospitals. Uh, HSCRC no longer funds the Maryland Patient Safety Center through hospital rates. Their funding comes primarily through membership dues, conferences, educational sessions, and other income generating activities. So this $1 million uh, enhancement um, from the legislature and uh, approved by the governor is a major enhancement for patient safety in Maryland. The legislation specifies that the funding may not be used for projects not approved by MHCC, which gives us stronger uh, monitoring, uh, a stronger monitoring role, I believe. Um, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Ike for his update, after which we would like uh, to request your approval of the new designation agreement. So we thought you may want to hear the presentation first before we get to that point. Absolutely. Dr. Ike. Thank you, Teresa, uh, and thank you to Ben and uh, the chair and all the commissioners uh, for having me back again today. So I'm Blair Ige. I am the president of the Maryland Patient Safety Center. Um, I know some of you, some of you I don't know. Brief introduction. Um, I've been a pediatrician by training and then moved over to the dark side of hospital administration where I was the chief medical officer for the Holy Cross Health System in Montgomery County for 19 years. Uh, I retired thinking I would stay retired, but the Patient Safety Center found me two and a half years ago, and I'm glad they did. It's been um, great working with the commission, with the Department of Health, um, and with all of the hospitals and outpatient health um, providers in the state in improving Maryland's, uh, the safety of Maryland's healthcare. Um, as Teresa described, we were created by an act of the legislature back in 2004 became a nonprofit independent in uh, 2007, and we still are. We have a massive staff of four people, uh, but we are about to increase to five. Um, that funding is helping us do that so we can actually take on more patient safety work in the state. Let me describe a little bit about who we are and what we've done over time, um, and then ask for any questions that you have. So the next slide. This describes our members. Um, that is, most of those member facilities, as you can see, are acute care hospitals in the state, almost all the hospitals. We have other um, outpatient facilities and, in fact, have provided free membership for a year um, or so to uh, centers that we're working with in the outpatient community, such as nursing homes. I'll describe that project in a little bit. And we had nursing uh, about 23 nursing homes as members for two years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, margins are pretty tight these days in healthcare, and especially in nursing homes and other outpatient settings, and they can't afford to remain members. Um, we're gonna keep working at it. We're gonna work at discounted fees because we would like to bring in more of healthcare settings across the state, again, to address patient safety. Next slide. Um, our board of directors, uh, the uh, our wonderful people, they uh, represent a, a broad spectrum in Maryland, both in the healthcare industry, in government, and the community. It includes two members of the legislature and Commissioner Boyle, who I understand is out of the country right now, so uh, we miss her. But she's been a wonderful member, a very active member of our our, our board. And we continually review our center strategic plan, something that I worked with the board on when I first came on about two and a half years ago, to really um, refine our strategic goals and to make certain that we were addressing the current issues in the state. The next uh, slide, please. So this is our strategic plan. It's not a secret. It's what we need to do. It's keeping Maryland healthcare safe. We hit on a lot of those important items in our vision. Um, I would point out a few words there. Convening is very important to us. As I described, we're small, but we can convene providers, the community, the patients and families, and experts across Maryland 
to address these issues of safety and health care. Um, we need to prevent avoidable harm, a law at all levels of health care, not just hospitals, but in the outpatient setting too. And it needs to be safe. It also needs to be equitable. And that is a topic that we've taken on in the last two years in terms of disparities in outcomes in health care that we think is vital for the state. Our goals are mirror that, um, to really have uh, reduce harm, a shared culture of safety, enhance uh, patient experience that involves patients and families, and support for caregivers. Um, this has been a stressful time during the pandemic for health givers, and we have staffing shortages across the state, especially in hospitals. We need to we ensure resiliency and prevent burnout in our caregivers. Next slide, please. These are our major activities. We provide a lot of safety education. It used to all be in person. Now we do most of it online, whether in Zoom webinars, or um, we've developed a, a larger catalog of e-learning where you can get self-paced and you can get credits, education credits through going through our courses. We have two major patient safety conferences per year. We've learned how to do those online, but we were back live in person last March. I'll talk about that in a moment. We run the Mid-Atlantic Patient Safety Organization. This is a federally sponsored patient safety organization. We're one of the first in the country um, so that we can collect patient safety data, errors that occur um, mostly in hospitals um, so that we can analyze them and then um, act upon them or help others act upon them. We have patient safety officer forums, patient safety officers at the hospitals across the state, um, providing them safe tables to discuss issues. We also have our Caring for the Caregiver program. I'll describe that in a moment, but that is caring for uh, peer support for staff in crisis. And we are, this is new for us, we are administering the state's Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Um, again, a required committee that helps with uh, determining what should be done to improve outcomes of maternity. And then our major collaboratives, as I said, we convene people and especially collaboratives over major safety issues. The next slide, please. These are two last two patient safety conferences uh, in the spring. I thought we fixed that, really addressed a lot of the patient safety issues. We keep thinking, we keep fixing, and then we backtrack on. And um, coming up in uh, November is our medication safety conference, um, focusing on system vulnerabilities and trying to build a just and appropriate culture for reporting and fixing um, errors in medication safety. Just by the way, tomorrow is World Patient Safety Day as sponsored by the World Health Organization and the topic for this year is medication safety. Next slide, please. This is our uh, Caring for the Caregiver program in conjunction with Johns Hopkins RISE program, which is stat peer uh, staff support for staff in crisis, mostly revolving around uh, poor patient outcomes or errors um, and you can see the gold is where we are now across the country. We uh, have uh, spread this across the country. We're growing every month. In fact, we are international now um, and what, in Canada and Europe and about to develop an online um, program uh, with Siemens Health and Ears, which is the largest online um, international program for um, health education. So we're very excited about this because it is providing support for staff in this staffing crisis that we're experiencing in Maryland and across the country. It is a lot better to support the staff and keep them instead of trying to replace them when they leave due to a, a, due to a crisis. So uh, this has been uh, quite rewarding to be able to promote this program. Next slide, please. Our clean collaboratives, we started in hospitals. That was phase one and two. Um, in terms of preventing transmission of infections in hospitals. When the pandemic um, exploded, we decided to um, move out into the outpatient world into nursing homes. And supported by the HSCRC, we ended up in 23 nursing homes across the state. We've completed those two projects. We're still analyzing the data, but we believe um, the data will show we've um, decreased uh, transmissible infections in those nursing homes and uh, also importantly reduced ER visits and hospital, um, hospital admissions 
for those transmissible infections. In fact, this has led to an application for a federal grant that we have partnered with Clemson University and the CDC to expand this program in the Mid-Atlantic um, and continue it for several years to try to, again, um, improve and reduce infection control in long-term care in the Mid-Atlantic. Next slide, please. Our newest program is Birth Equity Maryland. Um, with the recognition that um, our data on birth outcomes, that is severe maternal morbidity complications of pregnancy and maternal mortality, doesn't look the way we want it to. It is also not meeting the CIHIS um, public health goal of reducing uh, severe maternal morbidity in the state of Maryland, which is essential both for it's the right thing to do, but it's also essential for keeping the waiver. Um, we have embarked on an education program to educate about the disparities and implicit bias that is out there um, in uh, maternal care and also the complications of pregnancy that need to be recognized. There is a program, a federally sponsored program run through Johns Hopkins called the MD Mom Program, which we are part of, that is addressing this in maternity units across the state, so uh, obstetricians, nurse midwives, and uh, maternity nurses. And in partnership with them, we chose to um, address non-maternity providers, so mostly emergency rooms across the state, and primary, large primary care clinics, um, which we feel need our, uh, our support to, um, because they see pregnant and postpartum women just as well as um, the, uh, the, uh, the maternity units. Um, as you may know, black women in Maryland have twice uh, the um, incidence of complications of pregnancy than white women. This is not any different than across the country, but we're addressing Maryland. And so we think we need this work and um, partnership across the state with um, the, uh, the MD Mom program and other programs of its like to be able to reduce those numbers. Uh, next slide, please. And so with the funding coming from the state, uh, we are looking at new and expanded programs for fiscal year 23. We want to expand the birth equity program, uh, starting with further pilot sites, already in five pilot sites already, um, and, but expanding it further this fall and then going statewide in the spring. Uh, the Maryland Hospital Association's Executive Committee has uh, designated that we have the birth equity program in all emergency rooms across the state, and we think that's going to take about two years. Um, we are, uh, when we, um, when I testified before the uh, House and Senate committees for this funding bill that passed the, um, passed the legislature this past year, um, I heard distinctly from our legislators that th they were getting concerns from their constituents about um, assisted living across the state. Um, and they wanted us to help assisted living sites improve sa patient safety. And we know from the data that preventing falls in assisted living is a, the first place we're going, and they we're going there. Um, that will be rolled out probably around the start of 2023. And then we want to uh, develop further modules for our Caring for the Caregiver program. As I described before, we work um, on the stress induced by um, complications or uh, untoward complications of patients or medical <laughs> That this, uh, uh, um, that's affecting our staff. We also want to include modules on equity as that's become a major issue that's affecting staff over the last couple of years. And on violence in the healthcare workplace, uh, Ben talked about this and the uh, Senate Bill 700 earlier in the meeting. Um, I am chairing uh, the, um, the, legislator, the legislation designated committee on that, but we'd like to add that to um, or caring for the caregiver modules. And um, just a, a little tidbit in that regard, um, some recent data shows that three quarters of OSHA reported, uh, and that federal OSHA reported violence in workplace reports are in healthcare, three quarters. And that uh, a, a data just came out this week that across the country, two nurses are assaulted every hour in this country. Um, this needs to be addressed, uh, both because it's the right thing to address, but also because we need to protect our healthcare heroes and we need to keep them at work. 
Finally, um, the funding will help us to live stream our, our annual conferences, which we hold in person and they get uh, up to a thousand people attending. But we also want to reach those that can't attend. Uh, although we are not a big state, it is hard to attend sometimes from the Eastern Shore or from Western Maryland. We also would like to be able to spread out to the Mid-Atlantic to provide our services, at least in education, across the Mid-Atlantic um, through live streaming of our conferences. Um, none of the states around us, nor the District of Columbia, actually have patient safety centers. So at least if we can provide some um, education um, and interesting conferences for them, we're willing to do so. Our primary goal is to get it to everybody in healthcare in the state of Maryland. So that's um, sort of a synopsis of what we're doing. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, but I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support. I thank you for Marsha Boyle. And um, I turn it back over to Teresa and Ben. Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? It does. We would like to request that you approve the new designation agreements. Right. And I, if there are any questions, certainly we to answer those. Absolutely. So why don't we start with, I'll put a motion. Do I have a motion to approve the designation agreement for the Maryland Patient Safety Center? So moved. Right. Second. Commissioner Johnson. And second from Commissioner Wang. Are there any, um, thank you for the presentations. Thank you, Dr. I, are there any questions or comments? Um, I, Commissioner Bozinski here, I have a question for Dr. I. Yes, sir. Um, I'm in Western Maryland, a family doctor. I deliver babies. And um, <laughs> I find it interesting that you're expanding your birth program to the emergency department. Um, most ER doctors assist with pregnant patients by holding the door open for the uh, labor and delivery ward. Um, so what that, that's curious for me, why I talk about pregnancy in the emergency department, I guess, unless you're talking about first trimester complications, but uh, why that as a strategic uh, uh, role out there for the birth program? Thank you for the question and thank you for what you're doing. Um, it is, it, it does extend to both um, early pregnancy and first trimester and the postpartum period. What we've learned in looking at this across the state are two things. Number one, um, uh, ER docs don't always recognize complication of pregnancy, especially in postpartum women. If they see, and you understand this, of course, if they see um, a postpartum woman with a headache and um, maybe slightly raised blood pressure, they think it's stress and they send them home and it could be preeclampsia. And we, that is a complication you can't ignore. Another issue is that, and this may not be true in your setting, but it is true, I think, in some of the larger um, healthcare institution setting, if there is not always great communication between the ER doctors and the maternity unit. And therefore, they are not always communicating when they see a patient um, in a timely fashion. Um, uh, there's no blame here, everybody's See, everybody's trying to do their best. We just want to improve that communication across the state. We think it'll help these women. That makes a lot of sense. Majority of, or a significant portion of preeclampsia does present postpartum and those patients do end up in the ER. So I appreciate your work and helping for our pregnant uh, moms out there. Thank you. Just a quick comment. Uh, a very nice presentation, Dr. Eig, and I'm just glad to see that you were able to give up your uh, acting career and pursue the Patient Safety Center. I think the, the, the state is better for it. Thank you. Well, I thank you. I won't comment on my acting career. Um, I, did appre I appreciate the times that I've been able to do that, but I agree I'm better suited for this. I have one question, the, the list of new and expanded programs for 2023 up there, you mentioned earlier that the money from the legislature is supposed to be spent on programs that we oversee. Is that the list of the programs that? Well, I believe in the uh, data, the designation agreement we identified fiscal year 2024 will actually have programs identified and then we'll approve those for the funding. I see. So these are programs that were in place. We do support because we've been monitoring this, but will be more um, clear cut going forward when they give us the list and then we come before you and say, these are the programs. Okay. And that makes sense. I have no concerns with these programs. So, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I was just lining up the different pieces. So I, thank you. Um, with that, uh, if there are any other commissioners with questions or comments before I call the question. 
Okay, all in favor of uh, the motion to approve the designation agreement from the Maryland Patient Center. Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Ike. Thank you. With this, we are skipping ahead to agenda item number six, formation of the primary care worker group. The MACC is required by Senate Bill 734, Maryland Healthcare Commissioning mm -hmm. Primary Care Report and Work Group, to convene a work group to study primary care investments and make recommendations based on its findings that include quality and access to primary care services. The law requires broad stakeholder participation on the work group, and staff have assembled the work group composed of primary care providers, employers, payers, and state government partners. David Sharp, director of the Center for Health Information Technology and Innovative Care Delivery, will provide an overview of the work and nominees for commission consideration. David, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, for LeVon, I will say next slide when it's time to advance, but I'll start with, I'll start with here with the presentation slide. Um, so good afternoon, commissioners, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to overview the activities of the primary care work group and propose for your consideration stakeholder work group nominees. Next slide, please. The MHCC has a critical role in promoting adoption of advanced care delivery models. The commission's involvement dates back to 2010 when legislation passed that required MHCC to implement a patient-centered medical home. A unique feature of the program is that the law required the five largest state regulated health insurance carriers to financially support the program by providing upfront and incentive payments to practices in the program. Medicaid and Medicare also participated voluntarily in the program, which concluded in 2016. Staff started working on the development of two pioneering tracks in the MDPCP program with the Maryland Department of Health in 2017, and over the last couple of years, the development of track three. In January of 2019, the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health requested that MHCC convene an MDPCP advisory council that makes recommendations for the inclusion in the state's annual report to CMS considers program operational improvements and supports issue research, among other things. The MHCC has been involved with various practice transformation initiatives for several years. This includes convening some learning symposiums and roundtables, a practice transformation grant to the MedCI CTO, and awareness building of MACRA's healthcare delivery and payment reform requirements and participated in the CMS Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. Next slide, please. So some of this, the uh, Mr. Chairman, you already noted, but let me just touch upon it here uh, slightly. Um, during the last session, uh, Senator Lamb introduced Maryland Healthcare Commission Primary Care Report and Work Group. Chapter 667 of the 2022 Laws of Maryland requires MHCC to convene a primary care work group. The law requires MHCC to, su to submit an annual report to the Governor and General Assembly. The report must include an analysis of primary care investment over the preceding year, including data stratified by zip code and county in relation to the total health care spending over the previous years. Ways to improve the quality of and access to primary care services with special attention to increasing healthcare equity, reducing, reducing healthcare disparities and avoiding increased cost and any other findings and recommendations. In 2023, the work group is required to develop a primary care analysis and reporting plan, which is due to the governor and general assembly by December 1st of next year. I'll provide more information on the plan momentarily. Next slide, please. Okay, the work group scope of work is broad and encompasses analyzing primary spending, developing plans to improve quality and access to primary care, identifying strategies to reduce access barriers to primary care, and identifying approaches to increasing 
the primary care workforce. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, in 2023, MHCC is required to establish a plan for the analysis and report after receiving input and agreement from the work group as to the scope and methodology. The plan will be informed by work group deliberations, peer reviewed research, government and private sector policy reports, and state based efforts to strengthen primary care. Final plan serves as the required report due to the governor and general assembly at the end of next year. Listed here on this slide are elements of the plan. A few elements to point out, topics affecting access, cost and quality, relevant state policies that support or hinder improved primary care and experience of other states in assessing primary care investment. Next slide, please. A couple of elements to note on this slide include aligning primary care investments in high ADI areas to address health disparities and options for expanding access. Work group will also consider the structure for the reporting of the annual reporting, which begins in 2024. Next slide, please. Okay, and then next slide, please. So now we'll transition to uh, talk a little bit about the work group nominations. The following five slides are organized by membership category and include a nominating organization, nominee, and an abbreviated bio sketch. More information about the nominees is included in your meeting materials. The law mandates that nine identified organizations nominate a representative to participate on the work group. These organizations appear first in the table. The MHCC also received nominations from stakeholders representing payers, employers, and consumers, among others. If approved by the commission, the work group will consist of about 25 representatives. So as we proceed forward to these slides, we'll advance and pause for a moment, and, um, and then we'll continue on. So um, next sl slide, please. We'll just pause for a moment and keep going. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and next slide. Okay, please advance. So, Mr. Chairman, at this time, staff recommends that the Commission approve the nominations to the primary care work group. Great. So, at this point, uh, do I have a motion to approve the formation of the primary care work group and the nominations? So moved. moved. Mr. Wang? Second. Second. Commissioner Jensen? Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I heard another second. Who was who, who spoke up? Oh, that was Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Wood. So, uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Oh, great. Go ahead, Commissioner O'Grady. Hi, and would you mind going back to the previous slide? So I have a problem with this. These are when I think stakeholders, given that every that the other categories are different provider groups. Uh, other than maybe one with a stretch, I'm not seeing too many people here who are represent. They they are just other provider groups. We're seeing director of healthcare payment at the American Hospital Association, director of the business group. Maybe, maybe. that would that one I can see that kind of and uh, the the reverend from the hop from Hopkins I can see, but senior director of health and wellness programs Purdue Pharma. That's not a consumer. That's a pharma company. Uh, employee benefits state of Maryland. I, I think it's a chicken that. company. But I'm, yeah, I don't. Maybe these are not what I think they are, but they're not. Purdue they're, Farms. They're not like beneficiary representatives at all. Or at least some of them are. 
Mm. So, uh, thank you, thank you, Commissioner O'Grady. Uh, David's uh, asking me to respond. So, I think we <laughs> we recognized uh, that in terms of the. Let me touch on the what the employers that we uh, pick. Uh, we we have worked with the Mid Atlantic Business uh, Group on Health. Certainly not you know, uh, as prominent. Uh, in the landscape as a specific business group on health now, um, now the purchaser business group on health, but in talking to the executive director, um, I specifically told him not to give us names of large employers that happen to be in the healthcare sphere. Um, he suggested uh, that it might be wiser for him to serve than, than uh, just to, to grab a non healthcare employer to have one. And um, so we opted for that, that particular choice. The latter two, uh, we, we did think about uh, a couple other organizations, but I thought Purdue Farms uh, on the Eastern Shore is a very large employer on the Eastern Shore, has uh, you know, particular challenges uh one might say in terms of oh i take that back i thought it was purdue pharma you put on it it's regular yeah. the chicken guys oh never mind never mind <laughs> I really, I that one withdraw no i do view kind of large employers as they're consumers of this as well through what they you know the premiums they pay for their benefits i'm just not seeing any i mean we are in this unique position where we have we we probably have you know three thousand retired cms people who know Healthcare in and out, and are also citizens of Maryland, and not still working for. Them. I just didn't see how how like a director of payment out of a hospital association is considered a stakeholder in this. I, I mean, in the other categories, they would be fine, but I just don't see this. I'm viewing as consumer stakeholders, and maybe I'm wrong about that. You should correct me if I am. But there's these other categories of provider and different you know, serious, the insurers, et cetera, et cetera. This just, and, and those all, I thought you did a nice job. I thought those people looked right. This is just, I don't want, I don't want to vote for anything that says that somebody who's that the director of healthcare payment is an appropriate representative of stakeholders. They're an appropriate representative of, of, of providers. They're a provider sector, but this just seems that we could do better. Or I think the categorization, I think your, your point about how we categorize these probably is accurate. I do think that uh, Ms. Russell, uh, having worked, I, I believe she was uh, in, directly involved in providers, uh, but probably characterization of her as, as uh, she, is a, she is representing a provider group. Um, and we probably want to rethink that. We did look at a number of, if we wanted the clergy uh, and uh, Reverend, Reverend Johnson seemed like an ideal uh, representative based on his work in community initiatives. He is, uh, he is affiliated with Hopkins. But I think the stronger case is the REV in front of his name uh, than necessarily his affiliation. I think, uh, you know, your point on the MHA, we otherwise oftentimes pick an MHA representative rather than picking um, a half a dozen um, hospital representatives to think that they are, they can convene interest. Um, but I think, I think we have a good cross section of, uh, of uh, representatives. I do, we do have a researcher uh, that's mm -hmm. the rest of it, I have no question about. The rest of, I guess I would like to provide a friendly amendment that says, please drop Ms. Russell's name. I don't view her as a stakeholder, and I would be happy to help staff find an appropriate kind of more consumer person. Like I say, we have we have expertise in this state on the consumer side that that like no other state enjoys. We have, we have all these health policy experts, and if you'd like a retired one so there's no conflict, I think we can do that as well. If you look at the next item where we're talking about, again, and I don't quite understand the difference between the two groups, but you'll see that we have some very, you know, you have, you have a, on that, I believe you have two representatives that are kind of the consumer side who both kind of know what they're doing and they are consumers. 
I mean, I think that's that's the kind of person we need here. But I don't want to scroll up the whole works. I just don't feel comfortable having somebody who is so clearly a payer dropped into a slot that's supposed to be a consumer. So can I make a comment? Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Grady, for your, your feedback. Um, and probably it, it, it's been overlooked, but in fairness, um, Ms. Russell was recommended in part by the MHA because of her years of experience in public health and population health management. Um, she's, the role she's currently serves in um, is a little different, but um, she has experience in these areas and has also worked for the University of Maryland Medical Systems in the past as well within the area of population health and, and program management. So um, that was one of the reasons she went to the, to the high end of the nomination for list from the MHA. Right, and I think if you wanted to use her somewhere else in one of the other categories, that I would have no objection to that at all. But it's just I, I, I can't vote for this. Where we're, I, we're I think talking we somebody's can... kind of a consumer representative, and they're they're just not. I'm sure that she has great expertise. I'm sure she has great integrity, but it just it it just seems wrong to me. I think that we have the ability to add uh, one or two more. In fact, there. Uh, a representative from the federal employment um, community. We're still waiting for a rep, someone from federal purchasers, uh, but I, I would, my preference recommendation to the commission would be to move uh, Ms. Russell into a, another category, but keep her on the committee. And then we'll work with uh, O'Grady and any other commissioners that have a suggestion on a consumer that would be appropriate, that would be fine. Um, we are getting to the size that um, that the, the work group does become a bit unmanageable, but uh, we'll be happy to, before we go to the next one, for either David or I to tell the, to explain the differences to the committee of the two work groups, because they both are important uh, and we see different roles for them moving forward. So, this is Commissioner Bandarit. Uh, ben, do you think anybody from AARP will be a good addition from the consumer side? Uh, we we have a representative, do we not, from AARP, David? Um, I don't. Okay. Exactly. All right. Uh, that, I mean, that, working with Dr. Uh, Bandari and and. Uh, Commissioner O'Grady, Dr. O'Grady, I think we can come up with, a, with that acceptable consumer representative, uh, one or perhaps two, uh, that would fill that, fill that, you know, standpoint. I think the one point I would, you know, raise is we we want to um, get someone with real expertise in primary care. Uh, we have had experience sometimes with consumer representatives that have the, um, you know. Uh, why am I here? Kind of uh, expression. This is this I view really as a technical work group focusing on how we're going to set up investments. Uh, it's it is not in the as we are in the other group, the advisory council for the MDPCP. We've worked hard to get some consumers there uh, who can talk about. Well, this is what I see when I actually consume. Um, uh, uh, primary care services, and I'm actually attributed to a practice. Uh, we have at least one of those. Uh, what, actually, a member uh, who you may know, Dr. H Dr. O'Grady, Kevin Hayes, formerly at uh, MedPAC, is actually in a practice. Uh, we didn't necessarily choose him for his expertise as a health economist, but rather chose him for his perspective of uh, a, a retiree who was using primary care and a primary care practice that was um, in the program. Hope that hope that helps a little bit. Are there any other questions, comments? Mr. O'Grady, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. But that is a good example of the kind of, so we have this talent. I mean, we have, you know, three ex CMS administrators and the, the last two chief actuaries. And, and they are all tend to be old guys now who are retired and in practices. So that idea that, I mean, I, when I think of a, a really strong consumer advocate on a, on a panel like this, where there's tons of providers, 
tons of other payers, there's other things like that. That can't be the sweet little old lady who doesn't know anything about how healthcare works. It needs to be somebody who is up to speed and holds their own with the other very talented, as you talk about. These people are, are very high quality, very expert and experienced people. So, you know, my mother-in-law who's 93 is not the right person for this, you know, but you've got some, the way you talk about that. And I hope your other consumer on the other one, because they both look like they have the right kind of backgrounds to be strong consumer advocates, but also know how these programs work. That's the kind of person I'm looking for here. That's, and I don't mean to be a pain in the ass and hold it up. If you'd like to move it, I guess I can put that in as an amendment to move, uh, I'm blanking on her name again, but to move her into the payer category and then accept this and move on, just a slight modification so you're not held up in- Here's, my, here's a suggestion. I think it was your motion. My suggestion would be the membership category for almost everybody else on page one is just the name of the organization. Right. Right. We could just move her into the membership category of Maryland Hospital Association. I, I would move for that amendment. We take, if you take that as a friendly amendment, that just makes it the most. Can we do that? We move. Yeah. It. We move. With, I think that uh, Commissioner O'Grady wanted to add that with the, with the. I don't know if we added as a amendment or a, an agreement on the part of the staff that we would come forward in October with an additional consumer um, working with. with recommendations commissioners might have. I think that would, we'll come back with an additional consumer representative that, that meets some of the, I have a good idea of what he's suggesting and I think it's a fair addition. Okay. Are, are we trying to improve uh, with the movement of Ms. Russell? Are we trying to improve what's in front of us today Correct. and note that we're gonna add another one? That's, that's the motion. So, so that it will be formed, it will be these folks, and they'll come back in October with one more. So. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Excellent. Motion passes. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have one last slide, and if we could advance to the end. Oh, there we go. So um, Mr. Chairman and commissioners, um, the next step staff will take to notify the nominees of the commission action. We will identify a contractor to support select work group activities and move forward to convene the work group in the fall. And with the addition of the amendment from the commission, we will bring back to you all in October a nomination for the consumer slot. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. Appreciate the input. Thank you. I did have one question that wasn't really about the motion, so I thought I'd ask it is, where does telemedicine fit in with the work group? Where does, so Mr. Chairman, the question you're asking is where does telehealth, telemedicine fit in? Yes, telehealth this? is probably a better word, but how does that fit in with the mandate for this work group? Is that going to be part of the thing? So it is not actually part of the study, part of the work that's required, but we are, as just a reminder, working on recommendations to provide to the commission in, in the telehealth, preserve telehealth act that was passed last session. And we'll be bringing them back to the commission before the end of the year for review and approval. Thank you. Yes, sir. That, sadly, we're on the last agenda. So, David, we, uh, excuse me, Chairman. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how we see the two groups. Uh, I know I don't want to, you'll leave that question from, from uh, Commissioner O'Grady outstanding, but I wanted. Uh, so are you asking, are you saying between the advisory council? Correct. And, okay. So um, the, the question on the, on, the, on the floor is distinctions between the primary care work group and, and then the advisory council. Let me just start with a reminder and uh, my colleague, Anani Anyebo, uh, next on the agenda, will be making a nomination regarding a, an individual physician to the advisory council. And she will talk a little bit more about its, its structure, but it's really designed to look at making recommendations around programs, around um, recommendations that the secretary should consider. Um, it includes uh, certain aspects about the management of the program and to look at any kind of uh, research activities that might foster uh, more advanced primary care. Where this group, the primary care work group, the 
is, is a conglomeration of stakeholders um, that are more expansive than providers and looking at um, the uses of where primary care should, should be, looking at it in terms of how we solve health equities, disparities, issues, and, and issues related to workforce. And also, um, every year, it's, it completes the same type of review once it's the, what you might call is the decided upon version. And the first year of this plan carries us forward to each year. So we're looking at um, different areas of the state where the ADI scores may be higher, where there's you know, where there's opportunities to address health disparities, and health inequities, and um, there's also the issue of workforce. So just uh, you know, in a, in a sentence, the MDPCP Advisory Council focuses on the evolution of the MDPCP program. Uh, it was heavily involved um, uh, in the development of the third track. I see that as very much operationally focused or tangentially to taking on issues that preserve the MDPCP program, ultimately with the goal of making this program, which, which uh, currently is slated to, to you know, end in 2026, uh, to carry it forward. The Advisory Council probably is gonna have a longer life cycle as long as there is an MDPCP program. The work group, uh, although established uh, in statute, once it develops the plan uh, and we submit that, uh, I think it's an open question whether that would continue. The healthcare commission would continue, would take responsibility for executing on that plan. Uh, and I think we would have the decision, the choice of whether we continue the primary care work group into the future, or we are happy with the plan that's developed and, and close it down in about 18 months. Great, thank you. Thank you. Returning to agenda item number seven, our last action item, MDC, MDPCP Advisory Council nomination, Maryland Primary, this is gonna repeat some of what we just said, I'm sure. The Maryland Primary Care Program and MDPCP is a key initiative under the total cost of care model that provides funding and support for the delivery of advanced primary care. In January of 2019, the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health requested that an advisory council be convened by MHCC to serve in a consultative and, and advisory role to the Secretary and the MDPCP Program Management Office. The Nene Onyavo, Program Manager in the Innovative Care Delivery Division, will present a nomination for commission consideration. For consideration. Thank Nene, you. Please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Today, I'll be presenting a primary care representative nominee for the Advisory Council. Next slide, please. The MDPCP is a voluntary program that supports the total cost of care model and healthcare transformation by enabling primary care providers to have an increased role in preventing and managing chronic disease and reducing unnecessary hospital utilization. Next slide, please. Key council activities include gathering data from MDPCP participants and beneficiaries to support issue research, making recommendations for inclusion in the state's annual report to CMS on the MDPCP, and considering operational improvements to the MDPCP. Next slide, please. MHCC provides administrative management and support services for the council. Some staff responsibilities are convening the council, selecting representatives, and making recommendations and reappointments in collaboration with the Program Management Office and HSARC. Next slide, please. The primary care representative nominee is Dr. James Trumbull, a board-certified emergency medicine physician and senior physician executive. Dr. Trumbull has over 20 years of leadership experience in healthcare in the areas of clinical integration, utilization, quality management, performance improvement, physician education, community health, and the continuum of care. He currently serves as the vice president for clinical integration at Tidal Health, where he supports the integration of population health and value-based care programs with employed and independent area practices. Additionally, he provides clinical care isolated patients on Smith Island and addiction medicine services 
in support of the CIHES goals. Prior to his current position, Dr. Trumbull was the Medical Director of Physician Utilization and Vice Chair of Emergency Medicine at Frederick Memorial Hospital. Next slide, please. We recommend that the Commission approve the nomination of Dr. Trumbull. Next slide, please. Next slide. This table is a current list of council members. I've come to the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Andy. Let's start with, do I have a motion to approve the MDPCP Advisory Council nomination? So moved. Commissioner, and Commissioner Wang has seconded. Is there any discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. With that, come to our final agenda item. Let's count the motion to adjourn. Overview of upcoming activities. Ben, would you like to share the upcoming activities for the October? Sure. Public meeting? I, I don't have a uh, complete a list. Uh, first off, my apologies. The uh, agenda was. Uh, a little bit confusing to, because we had to change it uh, late yesterday afternoon. Uh, we do expect uh, several uh, uh, CON actions to come before the commission uh, in October. And we also will begin to start to unfold uh, what we expect will be some of the reports that are due in uh, due to the legislature, most notably the uh, the the recommendations on changes to the, uh, the coverage of telehealth services uh, that were were added uh, as waivers during the uh, start of the pandemic, but which there's enormous interest now in um, making those permanent. Uh, we will also uh, highlight a couple upcoming issues uh, where we think legislation uh, might uh, might be likely uh, one is potentially in the trauma fund. Uh, a couple others you know, are uh, areas where we, we have been asked to work, including insurance expansion. Uh, so I would kind of give like, give an overview in October of what we think uh, work we might be asked to participate in and get commissioners you know, thoughts about given you know, we have limited resources already. We have four work groups that we are staffing and uh, so there's still more work that people are asking us to do. Uh, someone told me you know, I wasn't a very good uh, practitioner of the word no, uh, but I think we do have to be careful about what we commit to do as uh, it's the, the staff of the commission and the commission itself are pretty well respected as being uh, unbiased or unfettered by you know, an interest and want us to weigh in on things because we matter. We'll also outline to you plans for orienting, uh, um, educating the new the new legislators. Typically, we get things uh, early on in the, in the session to uh, provide our perspective on things. I want to be sure you're aware of all of that uh, and talking about the strategy moving forward. I, I will also, uh, Richard Proctor, We'll be reaching out to you, to all of you to uh, get your uh, commitments on abilities to attend a day long uh, retreat at the uh, Friday after the November commission meeting. I believe that's November 18th. Uh, we will be, we've been working um, over the summer with our uh, contractor and health management associates, uh, and we'll want to put together some final clarity on the strategic priorities as we move into 2023. Obviously a new governor, a new set of, of, um, of, of individuals who will be in key uh, positions in, in um, the health system, state, state government. And uh, we'll want to have our documents ready to give up, put our best foot forward. So Richard will be reaching out. Uh, I would expect that, that uh, we would, uh, offer the possibility for those who want to to stay overnight in Baltimore on that Thursday and then begin the session on uh, early Friday morning. We can uh, hopefully 
concluded uh, at a time reasonable to be a bulk of the rush hour in Baltimore. So stay tuned on that. Happy to answer any questions um, before we, but the two people in the room cannot ask, cannot uh, adjourn the meeting. Uh, we'll add that first reference to make sure everyone's on the line. Only people in, in person have the right to vote and to <laughs> adjourn it before anybody else can ask questions. Yeah, you can all ask questions. Does, does anybody have a question for Ben? You will go ahead. A quick, uh, just a, a request for, for Ben and for the chairman. I, I would like to ask if perhaps we could have a short phone call at some point to talk about uh, uh, the contested case of legal docket. Thoughts I have on that. Sure. Yep. In time. And you are going to have a, if I'm just, and I'm just clarifying, I think you said you'll be sending around an email with opportunities where the commissioners are interested in volunteering. So, so is that, I'm, I'm interested in volunteering. So, should I wait for that email and then yeah, I'll, respond? I'll, I will. I will. Perfect. Thank you. If the, uh, Commissioner Jordan might have a question. Yeah, I do, uh, just real quick, um, Ben. Just just to clarify, I you know I know since our last meeting, uh, hopefully all of us had a chance to spend a couple of hours on the phone about the whole strategic planning and whatever. Is that what you're referring to um, uh, that we're going to do uh, in a session um, later after the the meeting in November or whatever, or is that a, is is what we've been through a beginning of a separate process and if so what happens next is that clear thank you, thank you commissioner uh dorden uh i had two uh conversations uh but i think in, this is a continuation of the work that began last november uh the consultants and staff uh had several meetings prior to the uh to the meetings with commissioners over the summer, the, what we call the mini meetings to talk about priorities. That information is gonna be uh, assembled um, and presented at the retreat. I think there'll be some, uh, we wanna encourage commissioner comments on, on those thoughts, on those potential uh, priorities. They, we will then, excuse me, over the next month, assemble a document that, that, that describes our strategic priorities. That will be a draft document that will be circulated to commissioners. And um, come no December, we would hope to have that pretty much finalized. And that would be a document that then will be shared with the legislative and executive leadership. Uh, uh, as well as stakeholders. So it, it all should fit together. I mean, I think one of the things that we um, recognize is, you know, how do we set these equity challenges, uh, priorities uh, into, our, into our set of charges in a way that can be effective? Uh, I, um, there are a few avenues, but I don't want to, uh, simply say we'll collect more data on disparities is that's our objective. I think you know that is a is important, but simply collecting more data is not my idea of a forward-looking set of initiatives in this area. Um, but at the same time we have to recognize that whatever we do, we have to fit to fit it together within our within our um, authorities. We can't with it, take it on without getting um, an anointment from the legislature and perhaps from the new governor as well as to what we might do. Does that, does that uh, help? Commissioner yes, Jordan? thanks. Thanks. I, I just know we, it seems like every year we continue to strategically plan and I'm not sure we ever come to any conclusions about anything we've ever planned. So uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, and I'll be happy to review the five priorities still as part mm -hmm. of effort on, on what has been accomplished with the five that we established in 20, uh, 20, uh, 18 and 19. Uh, I, think, I think there has been significant 
you know, success. Uh, I, what I, what may have been a good intent, but not well executed, was we started the strategic, you know, planning process a year ahead of time, recognizing that we were being remote, we were, were not touching each other directly. You know, maybe it went on too long. I, I kind of hear what you're saying there. The other thing I think it's important is if we all can possibly attend in in person for that November 18th meeting, that would be great. I realize everyone has, you know, you know is approaching the evolving uh, COVID-19 uh, endemic, pandemic, whatever we want to call that now. So I want to be respectful of that, but I do think having the commissioners together for a day would be very beneficial uh, and lead to, I think, a better product if we possibly can pull that off. Amen. I, I want to encourage also commissioners to start coming in for the meetings. And I know it's different. There are different levels of burden. Commissioner Mintz has a very long way to go. Some of us are closer, but it, so um, we are going to always keep some facility for folks, especially where we have remote commissioners to attend virtually. But I think we're going to have better discussions if we can bring more people in. And it's good for the staff who have to present to us and the folks who come before us to see I mean, Commissioner Wang and Commissioner Jensen and I are perfectly lovely people, but there's only three of us here. Um, and I'd like to, you know, see if we can start having more of us come in and, and appear in person. You share the nominee. I think and share the motion. Share the, motion. share the power. We don't, we don't get too drunk on the power. I don't want to make that. It's not a rule. <laughs> Obviously, we've got to be respectful because Maryland's a long state, right? And we want folks who are a long way away to be able to participate as well. So it's just more of it's more forceful encouragement. I'd love to see you all in person. So I, uh, Commissioner Pusinski had a, uh, a comment. Um, do you want to come off mute, Dr. Pusinski? Or... Oh, thank you. I, d I don't mean to, to belabor the meeting or extend it, but, um, you know, just as, as discussions around the primary care work group <laughs> evolved there, there was discussion of, you know, where there's high API, we need to, you know, focus on primary care, but I don't want primary care to be uh, pigeonholed as, uh, as care for the for the poor people. Good primary care is good for all people, and I think it's going to be an effective part of not only improving health outcomes but but decreasing uh, health expenditure as well. So you know, I think primary investing in primary care can be a tool for reducing uh, total cost of care amongst patients. Um, and um, anyway, I just want to put a plug in there. It's obviously near and dear to my heart, and uh, you know. There's many ways to improve, uh, you know, care for those with uh, disparities and a high disparity index, as well as for those with low. So thank you for allowing me to say that. Thank you. I agree. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Excellent. Excellent work. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Have a great month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.